early morning light filtered through the dusty windows of the veiled tome bookshop, casting long, delicate shadows across the rows of antique books. For over three decades, the bookshop had been a haven for collectors of rare manuscripts and arcane texts, a hidden gem known only to the most discerning bibliophiles. Today, however, it would become the stage for something far more extraordinary. Charlie Daniels, the shop's longtime owner, was behind the counter, flipping through an obscure volume on Tibetan esotericism when the bell above the door chimed. He glanced up, his keen eyes sharpening at the sight of the man entering. He was a familiar figure, with his sharp, angular features and air of quiet confidence, an antiquarian dealer named Julian Masters, whose reputation for tracking down the world's rarest books was second to none. Julian approached the counter, a knowing smile on his face. Charlie, I've got a riddle for you. Charlie raised an eyebrow. I'm all ears, Julian. What's the mystery this time? Julian leaned in slightly, lowering his voice. Have you ever heard of Shivaham, the book of the second death? Charlie's expression darkened. He'd heard the name, whispered among a select few in the rare book world, but details were scarce. It was supposedly written in the seventeenth century in India, a sacred text focusing on a secret yogic practice that allowed one to experience death consciously without succumbing to its permanent embrace. The book was said to reveal the mysteries of what lay beyond death, a path to higher states of consciousness. But most critically, it was believed to contain instructions on how to traverse the afterlife and return unharmed with the knowledge of what awaits beyond. A legend, Charlie said cautiously, the kind of thing that leads collectors to ruin. Not a legend, Julian countered, his eyes gleaming with excitement. It's real, and there's only one copy in existence. Charlie folded his arms, leaning back in his chair. So I've heard. The problem is, no one knows where it is. Julian's grin widened. Correction, no one knew where it is. I've traced it to an obscure Tibetan monastery, somewhere in the Himalayas. Charlie whistled softly. A monastery, huh? But which one? That's the challenge, Julian said, his voice dropping to a conspiratorial whisper. There are hundreds of monasteries in those mountains, many of them remote and isolated, but I've narrowed it down to three possible locations. Charlie's eyes narrowed. You're not the only one looking, are you? Julian sighed, rubbing his chin. No, there are two others. Eleanor Price, a British dealer with deep connections in Asian manuscripts, and Rajan Singh, a former scholar turned treasure hunter. Both are as determined as I am to find this book, but they don't know what I know. And that is? Julian paused, glancing around the shop to make sure they were alone. The book isn't just valuable because it's rare. It's valuable because it's dangerous. According to my sources, those who've come too close to the truth contained within it have either disappeared or gone mad. And sing. He doesn't care about that. He's ruthless. He'll do anything to get it. A moment of silence passed between them, the weight of the conversation settling in. Then Charlie spoke. So, you need my help? Julian nodded. You've got contacts I don't, Charlie. And more importantly, I trust you. This isn't just about money or prestige. It's about something far bigger. If that book gets into the wrong hands... Charlie's mind raced. The prospect of finding such a powerful secret text intrigued him. But the danger was equally clear. He rubbed his temples, considering his options. Then he looked Julian dead in the eye. All right, he said. I'm in. 
but we do this my way. The following week, they had reached Nepal, sitting in a small cafe in Kathmandu, waiting for their contact. It had taken days of planning and a few discreet bribes to the right officials, but they were closer now. As Charlie sipped his tea, he glanced out the window at the bustling streets. His mind drifted to the mountains beyond, their towering peaks lost in the clouds. Julian was tapping his fingers anxiously on the table, clearly impatient. He's late, he muttered. He'll show, Charlie said calmly, though he too felt the tension rising. Their contact, a local fixer named Dorje, had promised to lead them to the first of the three monasteries they suspected housed Shivaham. But so far, there had been no sign of him. Just as Charlie was about to suggest they move, the door swung open, and a man in a worn leather jacket slipped inside. Dorje was lean and wiry with sharp, intelligent eyes. He moved quickly, seating himself at their table without a word of greeting. The monastery you're looking for is called Rongbuk, Dorje said, his voice low and gravelly. It's old, very old, and few outsiders have ever been allowed in. But there's a complication. Charlie exchanged a glance with Julian. What kind of complication? Dorje leaned forward, his expression serious. You're not the only ones on this trail. The woman, the British one, Eleanor Price, she's already on her way. And Singh, well, he's been making inquiries too. It's only a matter of time before you all converge on the same place. Julian cursed under his breath. Then we need to move faster. Dorje shook his head. Speed isn't the issue. Getting inside the monastery is. The monks are wary of strangers, especially those seeking forbidden knowledge. You'll need to prove yourselves if you want access. Prove ourselves how? Charlie asked. Dorje smiled faintly. By demonstrating that you're worthy. This isn't just a quest for a book. It's a spiritual journey. The monks will test your intentions. Charlie nodded slowly, understanding the gravity of the situation. This wasn't just about finding a rare artifact anymore. It was about earning the right to possess it. We're ready, Charlie said, though he wasn't sure if that was entirely true. The journey to Rongbuk was grueling. They travelled for days through rugged terrain, ascending steep, narrow paths that wound through the mountains. The higher they climbed, the thinner the air became, and the more isolated they felt. There were moments when Charlie wondered if they were on a fool's errand, chasing a myth through the snow-covered wilderness. But finally, they arrived. Rongbuk Monastery was perched on the edge of a cliff, its ancient stone walls blending into the landscape as if it had always been part of the mountains. The wind howled through the valley below, and the silence of the place was almost palpable. As they approached the gates, a lone monk appeared, his face serene but stern. You seek Shivaham? the monk said, his voice carrying an otherworldly calm. But the path to knowledge is not given freely. Charlie and Julian exchanged a glance. This was it. The test Dorje had warned them about. What must we do? Charlie asked. The monk smiled, a faint mysterious curve of the lips. Only those who understand death can comprehend the knowledge within that book. Tonight, you will meditate in the Hall of the Departed. If your hearts are pure, the truth will reveal itself. As night fell, they were led into a vast, candle-lit chamber deep within the monastery. The air was thick with incense, and shadows danced on the walls as the flickering flames cast eerie reflections. They sat in silence, the cold stone beneath them, and began to meditate. Hours passed. Charlie felt his mind slipping into a trance, his consciousness expanding beyond his body. Strange visions filled his thoughts, flashes of light, swirling colors, and then darkness. 
A sense of weightlessness enveloped him, as if he was drifting between worlds. Suddenly, he was standing at the edge of a vast abyss, staring into the void beyond. A voice echoed in his mind, calm and steady. This is the threshold. Cross it, and you will see what lies beyond. He hesitated, and in his hesitation knew that he wouldn't pass the necessary test. The Book of the Second Death Episode 2 Charlie awoke with a start, his breath quickening as the last vestiges of the vision faded from his mind. The hall of the departed was still dimly lit by flickering candles, and Julian sat across from him, his eyes closed in meditation. The air felt heavy, dense, with a weight of something unseen yet palpable, pressing on his mind. For a long moment, Charlie sat in silence, attempting to clear his thoughts, but the unease within him only grew. He couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. His vision had been vivid, a glimpse of the abyss, a threshold that felt all too real. But the voice that beckoned him, it wasn't inviting. It was commanding. He glanced at the lone monk standing near the entrance, his face bathed in shadow. Charlie's instincts honed by decades of navigating the labyrinthine world of rare books and antiquarian circles, screamed at him that this was not right. This monastery, this ritual, it didn't feel like a genuine test. There was something too rehearsed, too staged about it. Julian opened his eyes, exhaling deeply. Did you see anything? he asked in a low whisper. Charlie hesitated before answering, his gaze still fixed on the monk. I don't know. Maybe. It felt wrong. Julian's brows furrowed. Wrong? What do you mean? Charlie shook his head, leaning in closer to avoid being overheard. It felt like I was being led somewhere I shouldn't go, like it was a trap. Before Julian could respond, the monk stepped forward, his expression inscrutable. You have meditated well, he said in a calm, even tone. The truth will come to you in time. But now, you must rest. Rest? Charlie echoed, trying to keep the suspicion out of his voice. Is that part of the process? The path to knowledge requires both reflection and rest the monk replied, his voice steady but distant, as if he had delivered the same line to countless others before them. Julian stood, his eyes narrowing. And what happens after we rest? You will be given the next step, the monk said, bowing his head slightly. The journey is not over. Charlie exchanged a look with Julian. Something was off, and they both felt it, but for now they had no choice but to play along. They followed the monk through the darkened hallways of the monastery, the sound of their footsteps echoing in the stillness. Eventually, they were led to a small chamber with two simple beds and a single candle burning on a stone ledge. We'll summon you when it's time, the monk said, before disappearing into the shadows. As soon as the door closed, Julian turned to Charlie. I don't like this. Neither do I, Charlie admitted. This doesn't feel like a real test. It feels like we're being kept busy, distracted. Julian nodded, pacing the small room. I've had this nagging feeling since we arrived. This place isn't what it seems. And that monk, I've dealt with enough gatekeepers to know when someone's holding something back. You think they're stalling us? Charlie asked. Julian stopped, staring at the flickering candlelight. 
I don't know, but I do know that if Singh and Price are still out there, we're losing time. If this isn't the right monastery, then they could be one step ahead of us. Charlie sat on the edge of the bed, rubbing his temples. There's another possibility. What's that? This whole thing could be a setup, Charlie said, his voice dropping to a whisper. What if Singh already knows this isn't the right monastery? What if he sent us here to keep us off his trail? Julian's eyes widened as the realization hit him. That bastard! It makes sense. He's ruthless enough to do something like that. Charlie nodded grimly. And if that's the case, he's buying himself more time while we're stuck here chasing ghosts. Julian clenched his fists. We need to get out of here. Now. Later that night, after the monastery had fallen silent, Charlie and Julian quietly gathered their belongings. They had no intention of waiting for whatever next step the monks had planned. Moving through the dimly lit corridors, they retraced their steps back toward the entrance, careful not to draw attention. The air outside the monastery was cold, biting at their skin as they descended the steep path that led back down the mountain. They had only been walking for a few minutes when a figure emerged from the shadows ahead, Dorje, the local fixer who had led them here. You're leaving, Dorje said, his voice carrying a note of understanding, not surprise. Yeah, Charlie said, this isn't the right place. We've been had. Dorje nodded slowly, as if he'd expected this conclusion all along. You're right. This monastery was never the true destination. Julian stepped forward, frustration clear in his voice. Then why bring us here? Why waste our time? Because Singh paid me too, Dorje said bluntly. He wanted you here while he continued his search for the real monastery. Charlie's jaw tightened. And you went along with it? Dorje shrugged. I have to make a living, but I'm telling you now because I don't want to be caught in the crossfire when things start going south. Singh is dangerous, and this book you're after, it's more than you realize. Julian crossed his arms. Then why are you telling us this now? What changed? Dorje glanced around, as if ensuring they were truly alone. Because Singh is close to finding the real Shivoham, and if he gets his hands on it, you won't have a chance. The book, it's cursed. Not in the way people think, but those who've come too close to its secrets have all met terrible ends. Charlie exchanged a look with Julian. What do you know about this book, Dorji? The fixer hesitated, then spoke softly, almost reverently. The Shivaham, the book of the second death, was created centuries ago by a Hindu sage, a yogi who claimed to have crossed the boundaries of life and death. It said that he wrote the book as a guide for those who sought to transcend the cycle of rebirth and attain immortality in the spiritual sense. But the knowledge in the book was dangerous, and not all who read it were pure of heart. Some sought power, others control over death itself. Over time, the sages who guarded the book decided it was too perilous for humanity and sought to erase its existence. Julian raised an eyebrow. So, what happened? Dorje's eyes darkened. For centuries, the book passed through secret hands, hidden by those who swore to protect it. But each time it resurfaced, disaster followed. Kingdoms fell, scholars went mad and treasure hunters vanished without a trace. Some say the book is cursed, but it's more than that. It's a test of the soul, and few can bear the weight of its truths. Charlie's mind raced, piecing together the fragments of history. And Singh, he doesn't care about the consequences, does he? No, Dorje said. He only cares about what the book can give him, and if you don't stop him... He will find it. Julian let out a long breath, his gaze hardening. Where is the real monastery, Dorje? If we're going to catch Singh, we need to know. 
Dorje glanced up the mountain, then back at them. There's another monastery, older and far more secluded, deep within the mountains. It's called Drachmar, and it's hidden in a valley that few have ever reached. That's where the Shivoham is. Charlie frowned. Why didn't you take us there in the first place? Dorje sighed. Because Drachmar isn't like other monasteries, the monks there are... different. They don't take kindly to strangers, and they guard their secrets fiercely. Getting in won't be easy. Julian smirked. Since when has this ever been easy? Charlie, however, remained wary. What's your angle here, Dorje? Why help us now? Dorje's eyes softened, and for the first time, Charlie saw a flicker of something genuine in the man's expression. Fear. Because Sing is ruthless. I don't want to be the one responsible for unleashing whatever that book contains. You have a chance to stop him, to make sure it stays hidden. Charlie nodded slowly. Then take us to Drachmar. Dorje exhaled, nodding in agreement. We'll need to move fast. Sing is already ahead of you, but if we're lucky, we can beat him to the monastery. The journey to Drachmar was arduous. For three days, Charlie, Julian, and Doria traveled through narrow mountain passes, crossing rivers swollen from the spring thaw and trekking through forests that seemed to grow darker the higher they climbed. The air was thin, and the cold gnawed at their bones, but they pressed on, driven by the knowledge that time was running out. As they approached the final ascent, Dorje paused, pointing to a narrow path carved into the side of a sheer cliff. That's the only way to Drachmar. It's treacherous, and the path is often blocked by landslides. If Singh is already there, we'll have to be careful. Charlie nodded, his eyes scanning the distant peaks. Somewhere beyond the jagged ridges, The Book of the Second Death, Episode 3. The ascent toward Drachmar grew more perilous with each step. The narrow path carved into the side of the cliff was barely wide enough for one person at a time, and the cold, biting wind made even the most sure-footed among them stumble occasionally. The higher they climbed, the thinner the air became, and every breath felt like a struggle. Charlie had been scanning the ridgeline for any sign of movement when he spotted a figure approaching from the opposite direction. At first, he thought it might be one of Singh's men. But as the figure drew closer, the silhouette became clearer. It was a woman, her bright red scarf fluttering wildly in the wind. Julian, Charlie whispered, motioning toward her. Julian squinted against the glare of the snow. Who the hell is that? As the woman reached them, her face came into view, pale, wind-chapped, but unmistakably determined. It was Eleanor Price, the British antiquarian, who had been one of Singh's rivals in the hunt for Shiverham. Well, well, Julian said, unable to hide his surprise. Miss Price, didn't expect to see you on this side of the mountain. Eleanor, panting and visibly exhausted from the climb, brushed snow off her coat and glared at them both. I could say the same of you too. Charlie stepped forward, his eyes narrowing. What are you doing here? Last we heard, you were ahead of us, tracking the same monastery. Eleanor shook her head, letting out a bitter laugh. I was. Singh made sure I was chasing shadows, just like he did with you. Only I figured it out a bit sooner. Julian frowned. You mean he duped you too? He did, she said, her tone laced with frustration. That bastard set me on the wrong trail while he gained ground. By the time I realized what was happening, 
I had lost days. Dorje, standing off to the side, seemed uncomfortable with the conversation. Singh has been playing all sides, he muttered. Eleanor shot him a withering look. Yes, and I assume you were his hired guide for the misdirection. Dorje had no retort, only a faint nod of acknowledgement. We don't have time for this, Charlie interjected, his voice firm. We're all on the same path now. If Singh's ahead of us, we can't afford to waste any more time fighting each other. Eleanor crossed her arms, studying them for a long moment. I'm not in the habit of working with others, especially competitors, but under the circumstances, I'm willing to reconsider. Julian raised an eyebrow. You want to join forces? It's better than the alternative, Eleanor said. Singh isn't just after the book for its historical value, he's after something more. And I don't intend to let him find it alone. Charlie glanced at Julian, and after a brief moment of silent agreement, they nodded. Fine, Charlie said. We work together. But just as the uneasy alliance was formed, the sky darkened, and the wind began to howl with renewed ferocity. Within minutes, a blizzard had descended upon them. The path ahead became treacherous, the snow blinding them and making it impossible to continue. We need to find shelter, Dorje shouted over the roaring wind. Through the whiteout conditions, they spotted a cave entrance carved into the mountainside. It was a narrow opening, but it was shelter, exactly what they needed to survive the night. Inside the cave, the small group huddled close together, the fire they managed to build flickering weakly against the cold. The storm outside showed no signs of abating, and it was clear they would be stuck there until morning. Charlie watched as Eleanor warmed her hands near the flames, her sharp features softened by the firelight. So, Julian began, his voice breaking the tense silence. We're all book people, huh? Seems like an odd profession for a life-and-death trek through the Himalayas. Eleanor smiled faintly, though it didn't quite reach her eyes. Collecting rare books isn't just a profession for me. It's more of an obsession. My father was a historian, and growing up, our house was filled with ancient texts, manuscripts, treasures from different parts of the world. Books became my life's passion. Charlie leaned back against the cold stone of the cave. I get that. I grew up around books, too. My parents ran a small second-hand bookstore in Edinburgh. I used to spend hours in the back, reading anything I could get my hands on. I guess that's where it started for me. This fascination with rare texts, the stories behind them. Julian chuckled softly, his breath visible in the cold air. And here I thought I was the only one with a sentimental backstory. I came into the business by accident, really. I was a journalist, and I covered a story on a private library auction. There was this book, an ancient codex, full of these bizarre illustrations. I couldn't stop thinking about it. That's when I switched careers, decided I'd rather chase down rare books than chase stories. Eleanor's gaze softened. But Shivoham, this book is different. We're not just chasing history or prestige here. We're chasing something deeper. Charlie nodded. It's not just about the book anymore. It's about what it represents. The idea that there's something out there, some deeper truth about life and death, about the universe. I think that's why Singh is after it too. He's not interested in just owning it. He wants whatever power or knowledge it holds. The wind howled louder outside, and for a long moment they all sat in contemplative silence. Each of them had spent years chasing after rare manuscripts, but the Book of the Second Death was something far more profound. It wasn't just a piece of history, it was a doorway to answers they all sought, whether they realized it or not. Eleanor broke the silence. I was raised Anglican, but I never really believed. Not fully. As I got older I became more of an agnostic, skeptical, 
questioning everything. But the more I studied ancient texts, the more I found myself searching for something. A deeper meaning to all this. She gestured vaguely around. Something beyond what we can see or explain. Julian nodded, his expression more somber than usual. I'm the same. I've never been religious, but I've always felt like there's something more out there. Maybe it's the years of reading old texts, trying to find some thread that ties it all together. Maybe it's just a human thing, to want answers to the big questions. Life, death, what comes after? Charlie shifted, feeling the weight of their shared confessions. It's strange, isn't it? We've spent our lives collecting pieces of the past, but when it comes to this book, it's like we're all looking for the future, something that will give us meaning. Eleanor's voice was soft, almost a whisper. Do you think the answers are out there? Charlie hesitated before answering. I don't know, but I think it's worth finding out. The fire crackled as they lapsed into silence again, the storm outside raging on, each of them lost in their own thoughts, thoughts of the path that had led them here and the path that lay ahead. For all their expertise and knowledge, none of them truly knew what they were getting into, but they knew they had to try. By morning, the storm had passed. The sky was clear, the sun reflecting blindingly off the snow-covered peaks. The air was still frigid, but the worst of the weather was behind them. Dorje stood at the cave's entrance, scanning the horizon. We should leave now, while the weather's on our side. It won't stay like this for long. Charlie, Julian, and Eleanor quickly gathered their things, mentally preparing for the next leg of the journey. The climb would only grow more dangerous from here, but with Singh ahead of them, there was no time to lose. As they set off, the tension between them had eased slightly. Their shared experiences in the cave had forged a tentative bond, though none of them fully trusted the others yet. Still, there was an unspoken agreement. They would need to rely on each other if they were going to make it through this. The journey to Drachmar was nearing its final and most dangerous stage. The ancient monastery, hidden for centuries, was within reach. But as they pressed on, the stakes grew higher. Singh was ahead of them, and the race to find the Book of the Second Death had only just begun. The Book of the Second Death Episode 4 The ascent to Drachma was steep and unrelenting, the path narrowing as it wound through jagged cliffs and icy ledges. The air had grown thin, and every breath felt like a battle. Yet, despite the harsh conditions, Charlie, Julian, Eleanor, and Dorje pressed on. They had no choice. The closer they got, the more the urgency of their mission settled into their bones. As they rounded a bend in the path, a surprising sight greeted them, a small group of Tibetan monks, their dark robes fluttering in the mountain wind. The monks were chanting softly as they ascended, walking with a calm grace that made the treacherous climb look effortless. The lead monk, an older man with deep-set eyes and a serene expression, noticed the group and raised a hand in greeting. Charlie exchanged a look with Julian and Eleanor, and they all nodded in agreement. Perhaps these monks could be an unexpected blessing. Namaste, Charlie greeted them, bowing his head slightly. The elder monk returned the gesture and spoke in a soft, melodic voice. Namaste, traveller. You seek the path to Drachma, do you not? We do, Eleanor replied, stepping forward. We are searching for something ancient. 
something powerful. The monk smiled faintly, as if her words amused him. Many who come here seek such things. We are pilgrims, traveling to the monastery for our own reasons. Perhaps our journeys are more intertwined than you think. As the two groups fell into step together, conversation flowed naturally. The monks spoke of their pilgrimage, explaining that they visited Drachma once every few years as part of a spiritual retreat. The elder monk, who introduced himself as Tenzin, explained that the monastery was a place of profound contemplation and deep spiritual mystery. But it was when Tenzin mentioned the Shivaham that the group's ears truly perked up. There is a man in our group, Tenzin said quietly as they walked, he has seen the book you seek. Charlie, Julian, and Eleanor all stopped in their tracks, their breaths fogging in the cold air. He's seen it? Charlie asked in disbelief. Tenzin nodded. Yes, many years ago. He claimed to have witnessed the sacred text itself, hidden in a secret enclave within the monastery walls. He told us of two monks, brothers by oath, who guard it day and night. No one enters that chamber without their blessing, and even those who are permitted inside, they do not always return. Why? Eleanor asked, her voice barely above a whisper. Tenzin's eyes darkened. Because the knowledge within that book is not meant for all. It is said to hold the deepest truths about life, death, and what lies beyond. But such truths are too much for most to bear. Charlie exchanged a glance with Julian. This only confirmed their fears and their hopes. The Shivaham was real, and it was within reach. But the warning lingered in the air, a shadow over their ambitions. They continued to climb together, the winds howling through the mountains. But as they neared the final stretch, something unexpected happened. One of the monks, the one walking toward the back of the group, began to lag behind, his posture growing tense. Charlie noticed him first, watching as the monk's movements became stiff, his eyes darting nervously from side to side. Before Charlie could say anything, the monk suddenly broke away from the group, drawing a pistol from beneath his robes. Stop! he shouted, the sharpness of his voice cutting through the wind. Charlie's heart dropped. It was Rajan Singh. He had disguised himself as one of the monks, and now the cold barrel of the pistol was aimed directly at them. Into the hut! Singh barked, gesturing toward a small stone structure nestled in the rock face nearby. Now! The group hesitated for only a moment before complying, their minds racing. The abandoned hermit's hut looked dilapidated, its stone walls crumbling in places, but it was the only shelter within sight. Singh's plan was clear. He intended to trap them there long enough to make his move on the monastery, unimpeded. Once inside the small, damp space, Singh stood in the doorway, his pistol still trained on them. I'll make this simple, he said, his voice calm but menacing. You stay here until I've secured the book. Then you're free to go. Try anything, and I'll make sure you don't leave this mountain alive. Charlie's mind raced, trying to think of a way out of this, but before he could act, something unexpected happened. From the corner of the hut, a figure stirred. An old man, wrapped in layers of threadbare robes, his beard long and white. The hermit, whom none of them had noticed before, had been sleeping in the corner. Groggily, the man rose to his feet, rubbing his eyes. What is this noise? the hermit grumbled, looking around at the group. Singh turned, startled. Stay back, old man, he growled, pointing the pistol at him. The hermit blinked in confusion, clearly unaware of the danger. As he stepped forward, his foot caught on a loose stone, sending him stumbling directly into Singh. In the confusion, the hermit's flailing arm knocked the pistol from Singh's hand, sending it skittering across the floor. Charlie didn't hesitate. He lunged for the gun, but Singh was faster. He kicked the weapon out of reach 
and bolted for the door. Julian and Dorje rushed after him, but Singh slipped through their grasp, disappearing into the storm outside. Damn it! Julian cursed as Singh vanished into the snow. Charlie retrieved the pistol and tucked it away. He's heading for the monastery. We need to move fast, Eleanor said, already heading for the door. Wait. The hermit's voice stopped them in their tracks. The old man, now fully awake, eyed them with an unsettling intensity. You should not continue, not if you value your minds. Charlie, Julian, and Eleanor exchanged wary glances. What do you mean? Charlie asked. The hermit shuffled toward them, his eyes clouded with the weight of years. I was once a guardian of the Shivoham, many, many years ago. I have seen what that book does to people. Some, they are liberated. They find a deeper understanding of the universe, something that transcends this life. But others, it drives them mad. The knowledge inside is not for the faint of heart. Charlie's throat tightened. You've seen it? The book? The hermit nodded gravely. Yes, and so did another long ago, Prince Darashiko, the eldest son of Emperor Shah Jahan. He was a seeker, much like yourselves, and he came to this very monastery in search of enlightenment. He read the book, and it changed him. He became more spiritual, more connected to the universe's deeper truths. But it also marked his downfall. His brother, Aurangzeb, was jealous of his newfound wisdom. He killed Dara, believing that power and conquest were the only truths worth pursuing. But before the prince's beheading, he wrote two books, partially inspired by what he had read at Drachma, The Compass of Truth and the Confluence of Two Oceans. However, he was not permitted to reveal the most esoteric of secrets, knowing full well that it could be used for immeasurable harm. Eleanor's voice was barely audible. What happened to the book after that? The hermit shrugged. It was hidden away, guarded by those who believed it too dangerous to be read again. But the temptation is always there. People like you, people like Singh, you come seeking answers. But the answers you find may not be the ones you want. The group stood in stunned silence, absorbing the gravity of his words. For a moment, doubt flickered in Charlie's mind. Was this truly worth it? Was the knowledge they sought worth the risk of losing their sanity? Or worse? But then Julian spoke up. We've come this far. We can't turn back now. Charlie looked at Eleanor, who nodded in agreement. They had all risked too much to walk away empty-handed. The hermit sighed, sensing their resolve. Very well. If you must go, then I will guide you. But heed my warning. This is not a journey to take lightly. The monastery guards more than just a book. It guards the line between madness and truth. With the hermit leading the way, the group left the safety of the hut, pressing on toward Drachma. Somewhere in the mountains ahead, Rajan Singh was already on his way. But now they had a guide, a former guardian of the sacred text, and with his help, they hoped to reach the Shivoham before Singh could unleash its secrets on the world. The monastery, ancient and imposing, loomed just ahead. The Book of the Second Death, Episode 5. The heavy wooden gates of Drachmar Monastery creaked open, revealing a sight that took the group's breath away. Nestled within the rugged mountainside, the monastery radiated an aura of serenity and timelessness. 
its beauty was in its simplicity, stone buildings arranged in harmonious clusters, each with a purpose as sacred as the last. The main courtyard opened to several enclaves, one dedicated to meditation, another to the study of ancient texts, another for food, medicine, and even one for communal gatherings. It was as though each space was a reflection of the monastery's balanced and ordered existence. Charlie, Julian, Eleanor, and Dorje stood in silent awe, their exhaustion momentarily forgotten in the face of such beauty. The buildings were modest, adorned with intricate carvings of lotus flowers and the ever-watchful eyes of the Buddha. A gentle hum of chanting filled the air, carried by the cold mountain breeze, and the scent of incense lingered as if infused into the stone itself. This is magnificent, Eleanor whispered, her voice barely audible, not wanting to disturb the sacred silence that enveloped them. The hermit, who had guided them here, approached the gate's guards, speaking in low, rapid Tibetan. The guards, both of whom were seasoned monks, listened intently, occasionally casting suspicious glances toward the group. After a moment of tense conversation, one of the guards nodded, allowing the group to pass through the gate. The elder of the two guards stepped forward, bowing slightly to the group. His expression was serious but not unfriendly. The hermit has spoken on your behalf. You may enter, but I must warn you, he said, his voice heavy with caution. We had another visitor not long ago, an ill man, gravely sick, who arrived barely able to speak. We do not know his name, and he has been in seclusion since. Julian exchanged a sharp glance with Charlie. An ill man? Julian muttered under his breath. That has to be Rajan Singh. He's playing sick to avoid detection. Charlie nodded, his gut tightening with suspicion. It fits. He must be here, hiding in plain sight. We need to be careful. The group was led through the monastery's courtyards, where monks moved gracefully from one task to another, some carrying water, others tending to plants in the small, well-tended gardens. Despite the simplicity of their surroundings, there was a richness in the air, a palpable sense of devotion and discipline. They were guided to a small, dimly lit dining room where the scent of spiced vegetables greeted them warmly. A simple meal was placed before them, hot tea and a modest but hearty serving of vegetable dal. The warmth of the tea spread through their chilled bodies as they ate in silence, the tension of their long journey finally beginning to melt away. As they finished their meal, the head abbot appeared. He was an elderly man, his face lined with age but his eyes sharp and luminous. His movements were slow and deliberate, each step a study in patience. Bowing slightly, he gestured for them to follow him. You are weary, he said softly, his voice carrying the weight of wisdom. Rest is deserved, but there is much to learn and much you must understand before your journey can continue. They followed him into a small chamber overlooking the snowy peaks. The windows, framed by simple wooden carvings, opened onto a view of the vast mountains where the world seemed to stretch into infinity. The room was sparse, containing only low cushions on which they sat as the abbot began to speak. Life in this monastery is one of rhythm and devotion, he said. Each day begins at 3 a.m. with meditation. We gather to chant the sacred mantra, Om Mani Padme Hum, the jewel in the lotus. For one hour, we allow the mantra to open our hearts, purify our minds, and connect us to the source of all life. Julian leaned forward, listening intently. The abbot's voice had a hypnotic quality to it, drawing them deeper into the esoteric traditions of the monastery. After the chanting, the abbot continued, we practice a twofold technique. First, contemplation, 
an active engagement with one's thoughts and the teachings we study, and second, listening to the inner silence that speaks louder than words. This balance allows us to become both the question and the answer. Charlie felt the warmth from the tea seep further into his body, blending with the abbot's words. The world of the monastery seemed to operate on a higher plane, one he was only just beginning to understand. Our days continue with structured physical postures, movements designed not just to strengthen the body, but to harmonize the flow of energy within. Each posture is a form of meditation in itself, a prayer offered through motion. The abbot's eyes twinkled slightly as he added, This is followed by a plunge into the icy waters of the nearby spring. It is both invigorating and cleansing, a reminder of life's impermanence. Eleanor shivered slightly at the thought of the icy plunge but remained focused as the abbot spoke on. Group chanting follows and then the sharing of meals. Each part of our day is a meditation, a reflection on the sacred and the simple. Even the act of eating becomes an offering to the divine. As the abbot finished explaining their daily routine, the group exchanged glances. There was something captivating about the strict regimen of the monastery. It was not just discipline for discipline's sake. It was a life designed to peel away distractions, to allow the soul to seek its truest form. After a pause, the abbot's face grew more solemn, and the air in the room thickened with anticipation. You came here seeking the shiver hum, he said, his voice deepening. The book holds great power, but it is not merely a text to be read, it is a guide, a living manuscript that interacts with the soul of the reader. The book is divided into three sections, but only one can be accessed by each seeker. Eleanor frowned slightly, intrigued. Why only one? she asked. Because, the abbot replied, his eyes darkening, each section offers a distinct path, a path that will transform you. Once you begin down one path, the others become closed to you forever. The Shivaham reveals the journey most aligned with your soul, but the price of insight is singularity. To attempt to learn more than one path would not lead to enlightenment, it would lead to madness. A shiver ran through Charlie as he considered the gravity of the abbot's words. Tell us about the three paths, Charlie said, his voice low, though filled with curiosity. The abbot nodded. The first path, found in the first section of the book, is the path of detachment. It teaches that all suffering comes from attachment to the world, to possessions, to people, to life itself. To follow this path is to learn to release all ties to the material realm and embrace the void with peace. The second, he continued, is the path of service. It is the most outward of the three, requiring that the seeker immerse themselves fully in the lives of others. It is through selfless service that one transcends the self and finds liberation in unity with the whole. The third path, he said, his voice growing quieter, is the path of contemplation. This is the road of the scholar, the mystic, the philosopher. It involves deep reflection on the nature of existence, a questioning of all reality, until the seeker transcends the need for answers. The group sat in stunned silence, each member lost in their own thoughts about which path would be theirs. Before you can access the book, the abbot said, you must reflect on your journey. The tea you drank earlier has already begun to work within you, guiding you toward the path meant for you. But be forewarned. If your heart is not sincere, if you approach the book with ego or deceit, the knowledge will shatter your mind. Many who sought its power before you were not prepared and were driven to madness. The abbot stood, motioning for them to follow. Rest tonight. In the morning, you will each decide your path. Once the decision is made, there is no turning back. 
As they followed him out of the room, Charlie couldn't shake the feeling that the decision they faced was larger than any they had ever made. The Shiverham waited, ancient and enigmatic, holding within its pages either enlightenment or destruction. Of the Second Death. Episode 6 The four companions retired to their individual chambers, their minds weighed down by the gravity of what the abbot had told them. The monastery, while serene and beautiful, now felt heavy with an air of uncertainty, its tranquil facade concealing deeper truths and dangers. As Charlie sat on the low, hard bed, his thoughts spiraled. The Shiverham was more than he'd imagined. A book that chose its reader, a book that decided one's fate. He couldn't shake the feeling that this was more than just a decision for enlightenment. It was a test, and failure would come with consequences far more severe than simply choosing the wrong path. There was a soft knock on his door. He opened it to find Julian standing there, his face shadowed in the dim light of the hallway. "'We need to talk,' Julian said, his voice low. Charlie nodded and gestured for him to come in. The room was sparsely furnished, like all the others in the monastery, just a bed, a small table, and a single window that overlooked the dark, snowy peaks. Julian closed the door behind him and turned to face Charlie. I've been thinking about what the abbot said. The paths, they're not just spiritual choices. They're a reflection of who we are at our core. Charlie raised an eyebrow. Go on. Julian paced the room, his hands moving as he spoke. The first path. The path of detachment. It's about letting go of everything. Sounds like something Rajan Singh would be interested in, don't you think? Charlie frowned. You think Singh came here for the Shiva Ham? I do. Think about it. He's always been trying to escape his past, his enemies, everything. What better way than to follow the path of detachment, to sever all ties and become untouchable? But if he's here, why hasn't he accessed the book yet? Julian stopped pacing and met Charlie's eyes. Because the book only reveals itself to those who are sincere— the abbot said it himself. Singh can't fake sincerity. He's hiding here, playing the part of a sick man, but the book won't open itself to him unless his heart's in the right place. Charlie rubbed his temples. So what do we do? We find Singh, Julian said, his voice hardening. Before he figures out how to access the Shivaham. If he gets to it before us, we're finished. Meanwhile, in another chamber... Eleanor sat cross-legged on her bed, staring out at the moonlit mountains. The abbot's words echoed in her mind. The price of insight is singularity. She felt a tug in her chest, a deep pull toward the path of service. It resonated with her, with the part of her that had always wanted to help others, to make the world a better place. But something didn't feel right. A soft rustling outside her door broke her reverie. She stood and crossed the room, opening the door just a crack. There, standing in the hallway, was Dorje, his face pale and drawn. Dorje, Eleanor whispered. What's wrong? He glanced around nervously before stepping inside, closing the door behind him. I've been having dreams, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. Strange, vivid dreams, ever since we arrived here. Eleanor's heart raced. What kind of dreams? Dorje sat on the edge of the bed, 
wringing his hands. I see a man, a man with a scarred face. He's sick, coughing up blood. But he's not just sick. There's something dark about him, something evil. Eleanor's breath caught in her throat. Rajan Singh. Dorje nodded. I think he's here. And I think the book is trying to warn me. Eleanor sat beside him, her mind racing. What does the book want from us, Dorje? Why did we come here? Dorje shook his head, his eyes wide with fear. I don't know. But I'm scared, Eleanor. I'm scared that we're not meant to find the Shiverham, that it's meant to find us. The night wore on, and the monastery was plunged into a deep silence. But inside Charlie's chamber, the air was thick with tension. I don't trust Dorje, Julian said suddenly, his voice cutting through the quiet. Charlie looked up, startled. What are you talking about? He's been with us from the beginning. Julian's eyes narrowed. That's exactly it. He's always been there, always helping, always guiding us. But think about it. How did he know to bring us here? How does he know so much about the Shivoham? Charlie frowned. You think he's working with Singh? Julian nodded slowly. It makes sense, doesn't it? Dorje leads us here, makes sure we're close to the book, and then Singh swoops in to take it. It's the perfect setup. Charlie shook his head, refusing to believe it. No, Dorje's not like that. He's... he's one of us. Is he? Julian's voice was sharp. Or has he been playing us this whole time? Before Charlie could respond, there was a loud crash from the hallway. Both men shot to their feet, rushing to the door. The hallway was in chaos. Monks were running in all directions, shouting in Tibetan, their faces filled with fear. In the middle of the corridor, a body lay crumpled on the floor. Charlie's heart stopped when he recognized the figure. Eleanor! He dropped to his knees beside her, his hands shaking as he checked her pulse. She was unconscious, but alive. Blood trickled from a gash on her forehead, and her breathing was shallow. What the hell happened? Julian demanded, grabbing a passing monk by the arm. The monk, his face pale with fear, stammered in broken English. The sick man, the one in seclusion, he attacked her. Charlie's blood ran cold. Sing. We need to get her out of here, Julian said, his voice tense. Now. But before they could move, the lights flickered, and the air grew thick with a strange energy. A deep, guttural sound echoed through the halls, sending chills down Charlie's spine. The Shiverham was awake. The group reconvened in a hidden chamber deep within the monastery. The monks, sensing the danger that had been unleashed, had taken them to a place of refuge, a sacred space where even the darkest of forces could not penetrate. Eleanor had regained consciousness, but was weak, her face pale and drawn. She sat huddled in a corner, her eyes wide with fear, as the group tried to make sense of what had happened. We need to leave, Julian said, pacing the room. This place is cursed. The Shiverham is dangerous. We were wrong to come here. No, Eleanor said weakly, her voice trembling. We can't leave. Not yet. Charlie knelt beside her. Eleanor, you're hurt. We need to get you to safety. Eleanor shook her head, her eyes filling with tears. It's too late. The book. It's already chosen us. What do you mean? Charlie asked, his heart pounding. Eleanor took a deep breath, her voice barely a whisper. When Singh attacked me, I saw something. I saw the future. Our future. The Shivoham is more than just a book. It's alive, Charlie, and it's already begun weaving our fates together. Charlie felt a cold chill creep down his spine. What are you saying? I'm saying, Eleanor said, her voice breaking, that we were never meant to find the Shiverham. We were meant to become part of it. At that moment, the door to the chamber creaked open, and a figure stepped inside. It was the abbot, 
his face solemn, and his eyes filled with sorrow. I warned you, he said softly, his voice filled with regret. The Shivoham is not to be trifled with. It does not give knowledge. It takes. Charlie stood, his fists clenched. What are you talking about? The abbot's eyes darkened. The Shivoham is a book of death. Its true name is the Book of the Second Death, and it feeds on the souls of those who seek it. You are not the first to come here searching for its power, and you will not be the last. The room fell into a stunned silence. We need to destroy it, Julian said, his voice hard. The abbot shook his head. It cannot be destroyed. It is eternal. Then what do we do? Eleanor whispered, her voice trembling. The abbot stepped forward, his eyes filled with sorrow. There is only one way to escape the Shivaham's grasp. Charlie's heart pounded in his chest. How? The abbot's voice was barely a whisper as he answered. You must choose the path. One of you must take the book's knowledge, and the rest must sacrifice themselves. A heavy silence fell over the room as the weight of the abbot's words sank in. We can't, Eleanor whispered, tears streaming down her face. There has to be another way. There is no other way, the abbot said softly. The Shivoham demands a price, and it always collects. As the group stood in stunned silence, the walls of the chamber seemed to close in around them, the weight of their fate pressing down on their shoulders. Episode 7, The Unveiling. The four companions, huddled in the dim light of the hidden chamber, reeling from the weight of the abbot's words. The Book of the Second Death, known as the Shivoham, had demanded a choice from them, a sacrifice that none were prepared to make. The air felt thick, charged with a surreal energy that each of them struggled to comprehend. As Charlie exchanged a glance with Eleanor, he felt something gnawing at the back of his mind. His thoughts were unfocused, as though a fog clouded his senses. He brushed it off as tension, but somewhere deep down, a faint doubt lingered. Rajan Singh appeared in the doorway, his figure cutting a stark shadow against the candlelit walls. His presence was an unwelcome jolt, yet strangely familiar, as if he'd been part of their journey all along. Singh's smile was smug as he looked around, eyeing the Shivaham on its pedestal with barely concealed avarice. So, you've made it this far, Singh drawled, his voice dripping with disdain. But the real question is, are any of you prepared to actually use it? You don't belong here, Julian snapped, his voice taut with suspicion. The Shivoham wasn't meant for you, Singh shrugged. Oh, but here I am, and unlike you, I understand the true value of such an artifact. It's not about wisdom or enlightenment, it's about control. Ignoring their protests, he strode toward the book, reaching out to touch its ancient cover. The group held their breath, expecting some grand reaction from the Shivaham. But as Singh's fingers brushed its surface, the book remained silent, inert, no grand revelation or mystical aura emanating from it. He frowned, clearly puzzled, his smugness giving way to frustration. What? What is this? Singh stammered, confusion etching across his face. Why does it show me nothing? The abbot's voice, calm but stern, 
cut through the tension. The shiver harm reveals only to those who are sincere in their search. It cannot be forced to reveal its secrets. Singh's face twisted in anger. You think I care about your metaphysical nonsense? He turned back to the book, shaking his head as he muttered to himself. There has to be a way. But as he spoke, the ground began to tremble slightly, and an intense feeling of disorientation washed over each of them. The Shivaham's pages began to glow, and an overwhelming sensation of vertigo overtook them. Each companion felt as though they were being pulled out of their own minds, thrust into visions of alternate realities. Charlie found himself in a world of serenity, where he had left behind every regret and pain. Eleanor, surrounded by people in need, felt herself brimming with purpose as she offered comfort and aid. Julian, haunted by his past, saw a path of redemption before him, and Singh, who desired control, found himself staring at a life devoid of purpose, empty and meaningless. Yet as each vision intensified, a sliver of awareness crept into their minds, a nagging doubt that whispered that none of it was real. Something wasn't right. Eleanor, grasping at the edges of her vision, began to realize that she felt disconnected from herself, as if her experience was somehow crafted, tailored to deceive. Suddenly, she gasped, breaking through the haze. This isn't the shiver ham, she murmured, clutching her head. This is something else. Charlie, too, began to shake off the fog. Wait, how did we get here? I don't even remember leaving my chamber. Julian's eyes narrowed as he focused on the lingering taste on his tongue. The tea, he muttered, realization dawning. The tea they gave us, it was laced with something. It's inducing hallucinations. The abbot's serene face flickered, a crack in his calm demeanor, as though he had been caught off guard. But before anyone could react, Singh burst out laughing, his voice echoing against the chamber walls. So, it was all a game, then? His voice was bitter, but there was an odd gleam of satisfaction in his eyes. The Shivoham is nothing but a projection, a talisman of illusions. The abbot's voice was even but tinged with regret. The Shivoham is real, but its power is not what you think. It does not reveal knowledge. It reveals desire. It is coded in symbols, meant to test those who seek it. Only those who understand its true nature can unlock its secrets. The tea was merely a means to reveal your innermost fears and wishes. But why? Eleanor demanded, feeling the anger and betrayal burn in her chest. What's the point of putting us through this? To teach you to look inward, the abbot replied, his voice softening. The Shivoham's true purpose is not to grant wisdom, but to reveal what already lies within you. Only by facing your own mind, your own desires, can you understand the path before you. Singh sneered, crossing his arms. So this was just some elaborate spiritual exercise? He scoffed, shaking his head. I should have known this was all a waste of time. Perhaps it was, the abbot replied calmly. But each of you has glimpsed a part of yourself that you would not have faced otherwise. That, in itself, is the Shivaham's gift. Charlie, Eleanor, and Julian exchanged glances, each of them trying to reconcile their experiences with this revelation. They had been drawn into a web of illusions, but the visions had revealed undeniable truths about their own desires and fears. The Shivoham had held up a mirror to their souls, and what they had seen could not be unseen. Singh, however, was undeterred. He strode toward the book, his expression darkening with frustration. If this book is so powerful, then I will find a way to use it for something worthwhile. Fame, fortune, whatever it can give me. But when he opened it, the pages remained blank, mocking him with their emptiness. 
Singh slammed it shut in frustration, his face a mask of barely concealed rage. The abbot shook his head, his voice soft and filled with pity. The Shivaham reveals nothing to those who seek it for greed or control. It is a talisman that reflects only what is in one's heart. The companions, now clear-minded, looked to each other, realizing that the real journey was one of self-reflection and discovery, not a quest for hidden knowledge or power. They had all glimpsed something valuable, something to carry forward in their lives, even if they would leave empty-handed. But just as they turned to leave, a strange mark appeared on the cover of the Shiverham, a series of symbols etched in gold. Eleanor stepped forward, her eyes widening as the symbols shifted, aligning into patterns she recognized. It's a code, she whispered, a message for those who see beyond the illusions. The abbot's eyes met hers and he gave a solemn nod. You are the first to understand. The Shivoham holds knowledge, yes, but it is hidden within its symbols, available only to those willing to decipher it without greed. And as they left the chamber, leaving Singh behind in his frustration, they realized the true nature of the Shivoham. It was not just a book, but a cipher, a guide for those willing to question not only the world around them, but the very depths of their own minds. As they walked through the monastery, the feeling of disorientation faded, the effects of the tea waning. They understood now that the Shivoham's true power lay not in its pages, but in the journey it compelled them to undertake, a journey into their own hearts where the real answers lay hidden. And somewhere, in the dim shadows, the Shivaham waited patiently for those brave enough to unlock its mysteries, one hidden code at a time. Epilogue This concludes the first part of the journey. Now begins the difficult quest to unravel the secret code within the Book of the Second Death. Originally, it was believed that the symbols were a strange combination of Sanskrit and Tibetan, but on closer inspection, it appears to be of an alien origin and not traceable to any known human language. Oh, money, but man.